What's up guys, it's River, welcome back to the channel, and today we're looking at manual photography. This is an essential skill for growing as a photographer and a filmmaker, but also being able to express your creativity with complete ease. So let's do a deep dive and take your work to the next level. Plus, I've added bonus scenarios on how to set up your camera for portraits, landscapes, and even nighttime photography, which is extremely challenging. Let's get into it. By the way, if you're new to the channel, we talk about everything and anything to do with camera gear here, from entry level to high end production gear, plus filmmaking techniques to take your work to the next level. So be sure to subscribe for all the future fun content we have coming out this year. And as a bonus, I'm leaving links down below to all of the gear that I personally use to make all of my work. Let's get into the video. We're gonna talk about three things today, shutter speed, aperture and ISO, and all three of these things are critical for learning manual photography. So we're gonna start with shutter speed. So in case you don't know what a shutter is, a shutter is a metal curtain right in front of your sensor that comes down like, kind of like a guillotine, I know. But the speed of that curtain is what we're talking about when we say shutter speed. Your shutter speed is expressed as a fraction, one over 60, one over 80, one over 300, or one over 15. That means it's 1 60th of a second, 1 300th of a second, 1 15th of a second. The amount of time that that shutter is up before it goes back down defines how much light gets onto your sensor. 1 over 50, as in 1 50th of a second, is what I like to call base shutter speed. Anything below that, you tend to get too much motion blur. 1 50th of a second is also what is known as cinematic shutter speed. Because a movie camera shoots at 24 frames per second, you have to double your shutter speed and you get 1 50th. But actually you get 1 over 48, but most digital cameras can't do 1 over 48, so most people shoot at 1 50th or 1 60th of a second. But treating 1 over 50 as my base shutter speed, if I go below 1 50th, my image gets brighter and I get more motion blur. If I go above 1 50th of a second, my image gets darker and I get less motion blur. Choosing your shutter speed really depends on how much light you need and what you're shooting. If I'm shooting an animal or a car, I'm probably gonna shoot at one over 20 or one over 300 because I wanna capture it right there in the moment. But maybe that's gonna make your image too dark and you don't have enough light. But there is a solution to that once you understand manual photography as a whole. And if I'm shooting someone or something that's staying still or not moving around much like a person or a product, I can shoot at a lower shutter speed like one over 60 or one over 80. That way I get more light, but also I don't get too much motion blur. So now that we understand shutter speed, the next thing to talk about is aperture. And understanding how aperture is expressed can be kind of confusing, so hang in there. Aperture is expressed by a number with f in front of it. So if you're shooting your aperture wide open, you might get something like f 2.8, f 1.4. But if you're shooting with your aperture closed down, you might be shooting at f 11 or f 16. Inside of every single lens is a small metal pupil kind of like the ones in your eye. If you open it up, you let more light in, and if you close it down, you let less light in. However, there's a secondary effect to opening or closing your aperture. So we already know when you close down your aperture, you get less light, and when you open up your aperture, you get more light. But the other thing that also changes is your depth of field. Your depth of field is defined by the amount of things that are in focus behind the point of focus. Let me demonstrate with my trusty T7 and my Mortal Kombat figure. So I've got my Canon T7 right here, one of the best beginner cameras on the market. I love this thing. So with my Canon T7, I've set up a few figures right here, a ninja, Raiden from Mortal Kombat, and a skull. So if I take a photo at f25, which is really, really high, and a shutter speed of 100, and my ISO is just blasted for this demonstration, but when I take this photo, you'll notice that the ninja's in focus, but so are the things behind the ninja. And next, if I take that exact same photo, I don't move my camera whatsoever, and I take my uh, f-stop all the way to f4.0, which isn't the shallowest, but that's the most that this camera can do. And I'll uh, raise my shutter speed just so I get good exposure. And you'll notice that everything behind the Ninja is much blurrier. The Ninja really stands out more in the shot and the things in the back shelf are pretty much indistinguishable. Basically, this phenomenon is called depth of field. Whatever your focal point is, in this case, my Ninja, Everything behind it will get blurrier as my aperture opens up and the depth of field gets smaller. Basically, you wanna think of there's being a small section that stays in focus 
if you have a wide aperture, that small section of, that's in focus gets smaller and smaller and thinner. And if you go to something like f1.4, you can often see photos of people where their nose is in focus, their eyes are in focus, and the ears are out of focus, or their eyes are in focus and the nose is out of focus, the ears are in fo out of focus. You can get these really beautiful shallow depth of field shots where things really, really stand out. But if you're maybe doing landscapes, you want everything in focus. You don't want that shallow depth of field. And for that, you would go to F9 or F11 where everything's in focus and the audience can really sit there and look at every tiny detail in your shot. It really just depends on what you're shooting. If you guys want to learn exactly how to get the best out of your camera and turn your passion into a profitable side hustle, we'll be coming out with a tech through the lens course that will do exactly that. Look out for the link in the description down below. So I mentioned earlier, the three things we're talking about is shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. And you have to balance the three things to get an appropriate exposure. So let's try balancing just our shutter speed and aperture for this example. So let's say I want to shoot at a really high shutter speed of 1 over 400, which is really fast, and my aperture is at 1 over 13. Now, if I take a photo, you'll see that this photo is really, really dark. So what could I do? I could probably open up my aperture. Now, if I open all the way up to f4.0, that is a much better exposure, and it's pretty acceptable. So if you have to shoot at a really fast shutter speed, you open up your aperture. But, you know, maybe I don't want so much depth of field, and for that, just as like an example, I will take my aperture and close it down to 7.0 and I'll have, and what I'll do here is I'll open up my shutter speed to 1 over 25 and it's not a perfect exposure, but I get a much better exposure. But what if you want to have your shutter speed at let's say 1 over 400 and you also want to have your aperture at 1 over 14. Now you would never really want to do this, but for, for the sake of the example, let's say we have that. And if I take a photo, it's a very, very dark photo. So in this case, we would actually raise our ISO, which is actually the most exciting part of this video. So when it comes to ISO, it's actually one of the most interesting parts of a camera and actually determines a lot about the image that comes out of said camera and every camera manufacturer does it differently. It's kind of a confusing topic, but I promise to make it simple. And in case you're wondering, ISO itself doesn't mean anything. It just means international standardization organization. It was something we came up with a long time ago. We never really changed it. Instead, I like to think of ISO as sensitivity. For the sake of keeping things simple, let's talk about ISO just for digital cameras. So you have a digital camera with a digital sensor inside of it. And that sensor is sensitive to light. Now, if you change the voltage or the electrical current on that sensor, if it's at ISO 100, it's very low current and your sensor just picks up a little bit of light. But if you go all the way to ISO 6400, you have more voltage and your sensor becomes way more sensitive to light. The best way to think about ISO is like a volume knob of sensitivity on your camera or like on a music speaker. When you're at ISO 100, you can't really hear the music it's very dim and low and, and ISO 100 for a camera, it doesn't really pick up a lot of light. You know, all the lights seem very dim. But if you were to crank up your music speaker all the way to ISO 6400, the music gets really loud. Everyone can hear the music, much like your camera. At 6400, it will pick up every little speck of light. Often, really good cameras see more than you can with your eyes. And you might be thinking, oh, that's easy. I'll just have my ISO super high all the time and I'll just shoot at whatever aperture and shutter speed I like. Not exactly. Unless you have something like the a7 III or the a7S III, you're not going to get very good noise performance. So when you turn up the voltage in your camera, your camera will heat up and you'll actually start to get grain and noise. Like if you will often notice, if you watch old TVs, you'll get like random purple in the sound, you'll get random blues on your screen. That's called noise or signal interference. So when you turn up the volume or the sensitivity on your camera, it starts to pick up everything around it. And it also starts to generate heat. And when you shoot something at ISO 6400, you'll see a lot of bad colors. You'll see a lot of noise in there. But at ISO 100, you'll see very little noise and all your images look silky smooth. And depending on what camera you have, different cameras will look their best on different ISOs. For example, this Canon T7 will look best between the ISO 400 and 800. And if I actually shoot ISO 100, it won't look quite as good as it could at 400 and it will actually get less dynamic range. But 
That's a more complicated topic. What you need to remember is if you shoot very high ISO, you're going to get a lot of grain. If you shoot very low ISO, you're going to get very clean images. And the best thing to do is figure out what camera you have, do a quick Google search, and generally, if you look up base ISO or native ISO, results will come up that show you where your camera looks the best and what ISO you should be using. And a key thing to know is base ISO for photos is often different for cameras than base ISO for video. And ultimately, if you can balance your shutter speed, your aperture, and your ISO, you can absolutely get magical and stunning images. Lastly, let's do a really important exercise on how to set up your camera for different shooting environments. Whether you're shooting portraits, landscapes, or nighttime photography, you are gonna have to set up your camera in very, very different ways. So let's start off with portraits. Because I don't have a model with me right now, we're gonna use my Mexican sugar skull. So I've got this person's face. It's not moving at all, though it'd be kind of scary if it did. However, I don't need to worry about motion blur. So I'm actually gonna have my shutter speed at F, uh, sorry, my shutter speed at one over 50. And because I wanna get a really shallow depth of field, I'm gonna have my aperture set to F4 3.5. And that's now a little bit too bright. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into my ISO and set it to 100. There it looks pretty good and I've done everything that I can. I'm avoiding motion blur, especially for a portrait because you don't want the person to slightly twitch or move around. You wanna avoid all motion blur and 3.5 and 100. Uh, but what if the person was kind of mo moving around and sitting? I would normally shoot portraits at F125. That way, if they do twitch a little bit, they do kind of like get facial expressions, I'm, catch I'm catching them right there in the moment, F125. And if I'm at F3.5, uh, sorry, one over 30, 25 is my shutter speed. And if my aperture is F3.5, hmm, that's still pretty good, but I'm also shooting this on 18 millimeters. So here's a quick hack. You always wanna shoot portraits on a 50, 70, or 100. You never wanna shoot on a wide lens like an 18 or 24. So I'm gonna set this all the way to F55. Now, because of the nature of this lens, it's actually going to close down the aperture. Now here, this looks too dark. And so because it's too dark and my shutter speed is pretty high at F, uh, sorry, my shutter speed's pretty high at one over 25, I'm gonna go into ISO and now raise my ISO to 400. And just like that, I have a balanced portrait. One over 25 shutter speed, F uh, 4.5 and ISO 100. And that you get a pretty spicy Mexican sugar skull portrait. So because I don't have mountains in my studio, we're gonna just use a wide shot. So if you wanna shoot landscapes, you wanna shoot on a wide angle lens, like an 18 or 24. And you wanna make sure everything's fairly in focus. You don't want shallow depth of field for a landscape shot at all. So let's see, now I would say what, I would actually shoot landscapes at probably one over 25 shutter speed or um, one over 60 because if I'm just holding it without a tripod, my hands themselves will shake. But if you're on a tripod, you could go as low as one over 50, one over 60, or even one over 30, like because you're just not gonna get any shake. And because I wanna get everything in focus, I'm actually gonna try to go down, my, take my aperture down to like F18. And something to note, every lens is, diff is sharp at different f-stops, so do a quick Google search on the lens you're specifically using. So at f22, pretty much everything's gonna be sharp. And I'm on a wide angle lens, I'm at f30, and now because of that, this image itself, if I take a photo, this image looks fine, but I can still improve upon it by going to ISO and actually lowering my ISO down to 400. And now, actually that looks a little too dark, so I'm gonna go back into ISO, ISO 800, and get a very, very decent exposure. But let's just say it was a little bit too dark, F uh, one over 25 shutter speed, and I, ha I get a photo that where everything's fairly in focus, it's nice and bright, and just like that, I've exposed for a landscape. And lastly, we're gonna talk about nighttime photography, which in my opinion is the most challenging thing to shoot. When it comes to nighttime photography, you're kind of in a sticky situation. You don't have enough light, so you're gonna get a lot of motion blur if you have a low shutter speed. You can't really shoot wide open all the time, maybe because your lens doesn't go that wide open or because you're shooting landscapes and you don't want a shallow depth of field. 
And if you crank your ISO all the way to the top, you're gonna get a really noisy image. The best way to fix this is actually with a tripod. By having a tripod, you can have a much lower shutter speed while keeping your f-stop and your ISO at an acceptable value. For example, I did these landscape shots, and as you can see, when I first shot these, my aperture was way too high, my shutter speed was way too high, and my ISO was too low, and everything came out really dark. But even when I cranked up my ISO, brought my shutter speed down to one over 60, and had my f-stop at f9, because I need that for a landscape, still too dark. So what I did was, I set my f-stop to f9, ISO to 800, and then I did a 30 second and a 15 second exposure. And as you can see, these images got a whole lot brighter. And because it's on a tripod, there's no motion blur. You can also do this with models. Can have a model hold really still, do maybe one over 15 seconds or a three second exposure. And if they can hold still long enough, you can get some pretty interesting images. Though I wouldn't recommend this for close-up portraits because try keeping your face still for three seconds. It's not possible, but if you're doing a wide landscape shot with a model in it, most models can hold still for a while. However, if you ever find yourself in a position where your settings are maxed out and you still don't have enough exposure, just have a small battery powered light. I got this, I think maybe 40, 50 bucks off Amazon. This one was maybe 25 bucks and they give you just enough juice to get a decent image. So definitely have a battery powered lights. They're not that expensive. And you know, sometimes you just gotta bring in a light. And that my friends concludes our tutorial on manual photography. If I did a good job, make sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel for future content. And if I didn't do a good job, still leave a like, but leave me a comment down below on what I could do better. That's pretty much it for this video guys. See you in the next video.